and welcome to A Problem Squared, a podcast where mathematician Matt Parker... That's me. That's him. And not mathematician Bekil, that's me, <laughs> will endeavour <laughs> to solve your problems, such as how do we open this podcast without sounding <laughs> awkward... Yeah, that's not a that's not a ding yet, is it? That's, no, uh... not a ding yet. On this episode, we will be solving problems such as height differences in kitchens and arguing couples. Is the land surface area of a country including the slopes or not? And something about dishwashing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Plus, we've got some updates <laughs> on photos of big things and Beck's t-shirt. Yeah, the £5,000 charity one, not the one that I'm currently wearing. <laughs> not just the teacher. It's really sweaty. <laughs> right, Beck, so how are you doing? I'm well. I'm really well. I've been exercising more. My One well of my favourite comedians, who also happens to be one of my friends, uh, Abigailia, has been... She, she went on a little hiatus, but she's come back. She teaches yoga on Instagram three times a week on Mondays, oh, Wednesdays wow. and Fridays. So... We're recording this on a Friday, so I've actually said that we have to stop by a specific time. You've set I, yeah. a very hard deadline because I have to do my online yoga. yoga is happening. Well, fair enough. Yeah, it's keeping me fit. So that's been nice and social because then you see all the other people who log on to Instagram to watch as well and do it at the same time. So you get like that little chat room. So you kind of feel like, oh, we're all in this together. And she's really funny as well. I was always very anti-yoga. Um, I think just because anytime someone is quite evangelical about something, it really puts me off <laughs> due to <laughs> bad previous experience. And I finally was like, oh, I'll do it just to be a supportive friend. And it's so much fun. And she's great because she's like this sarky New York comedian who lives in Britain. And so she's got this oh, that's like... that's exactly what you want. You don't want a hippie doing your yoga. No. So she's like, she's got that positivity that Americans have where she's very much like, yeah, man, you do you. You be the best you you can. But also she'll say things like, and you can try to touch your toes here, but hey, it's Monday. Who cares, right? You know, like she's really... <laughs> I, I love it. It makes me... She's very funny and uh, personable. So I, I look forward to them. So that's been keeping me sane in uh, in this situation. How about you? Well, just this week, Lucy, my wife and I, um, celebrated our 100th consecutive day at home together. As most of us do, Matt. You're not special. Well, that's why well, this is what I was wondering. I think for a lot of people, they're like, and, but that's a personal best for our relationship in over a decade of living in the same house. I think that's the most consecutive nights we've both been home together just through the nature of both our jobs there's a lot of travel that that that's a new yeah that's never happened before so we, we were amazed so of course you know i'd calculated when it would be i'd put it in the diary and i cooked a 100 consecutive days at home together dinner oh what was in it it 100 was two peas. pizzas well, no, well, wow, you're not far <laughs> off. It was a hundred of everything. Um, That's a problem for the next episode, Matt. If you're going to cook a hundred, a meal where everything was a hundred of something. Multiple of a hundred, what should it be? I reckon fried rice. It, yeah. But actually, that's not much rice, is no, it? No, it's somewhere. It's it's a lower bound is rice. It's it's more than that, and an upper bound is like um, hamburgers. So somewhere in between, there's something you could have a hundred of and be sated. No, no, no. I just made a 100. So like a lot of people, I've had to do baking oh. at home during the lockdown because getting mm -hmm. bread was difficult. And uh, we ha we've got our own um, sourdough starter culture now, oh, which I'm very proud gosh. of. Oh my gosh. I just tuned out. I just stopped the podcast just then. I named it Trev. Trev, Trev the uh, sourdough culture. So, but actually I had some, I, I splashed out on some instant yeast, which we have a little bit left of. And I've been making pizza dough reasonably regularly. So I made two pizzas, mm -hmm. but then I also, which I've not done before for the first time, made a stick of garlic bread from ah. scratch. Uh, and because then when you put that next to the pizzas, it spells out in digits 100. Or zero zero one, one and the two zero, depending on or what zero zero one side or zero one on. zero. There's six different ways we could. Well, the pizzas are not identical, so there are six different ways you could arrange these things. Yeah, the way that I would arrange them is rather phallic. That's <laughs> that's <laughs> okay, excluding that one. I was just thinking as digits. My goodness, it was a romantic evening. 
Um, <laughs> I took a photo of it all, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> oh, ah, fine. Um, anyway, yeah. So I, I'm sure everyone, for everyone else, they're thinking a hundred days. That's not very special, but for us, it was the first time, and uh, we've we've double checked that we didn't just get on because both of us were off and away traveling. We, we're still genuinely getting on despite both being home together all the time. Either that, that, that was... or she's hugely unhappy but knew that there was going to be two pizzas and garlic bread coming soon. Two pizzas and garlic bread of it. Yeah, exactly. Held on for as long as she could. <laughs> I've got to put 200 in the diary now. So if anyone knows something I can bake in the shape of a two, I would love to hear about it. A snake. A cake. A snake. A snake. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, a swan. A swan is a two number. Looks swan. like a two. There you go. Deal. Bake a swan. I will <laughs> bake a garlic swan. We have a problem in from someone named Manic, which is actually a first for us on A Problem Squared. This is episode 008. And for the first time, we've got a repeat problemer. So, Manic gave us a question previously. I'm sure I recognize that name. Mm. I think I think Manic gave us the problem about too much, how much pizza is too much pizza. That's one of our top problems. Yeah. yeah. Manic says, I've got a problem. My brother keeps complaining about a situation he and his wife are in. Okay, that's really their problem, not yours, Manic, but fine. Uh, namely, he's pretty tall and she's definitely short. And neither of them like using the kitchen counters because the average height that they are designed for is uncomfortable to reach down to or reach up to respectively. How can I get him to stop complaining to me about this problem? <laughs> Smiley face. Or even better, what could they do to solve their kitchen height woes? So, Beck. Can we either stop them from complaining or can you fix the root problem? Yeah, well, I, I offered to problem solve this one because I, I actually thought it was a really interesting one, especially as my husband is is quite tall. And I would like people to know that I am an average height for my age and, wow. and stature. But apparently everyone else thinks that I'm small. Uh, I get it a lot. I don't know what it is. It must be about the way that I walk. But a lot of people, if I ask them when I'm sitting down to hold their hand up to how high they think I am. Oh, really? It is always, it's always about at least 10 centimeters lower than what I actually am. Wow. Oh, now I really want to do that experiment. I've had friends who are shorter than me insist that we're the same height or they're taller. I had a friend who was the same height as me reach up to get something out of the cupboard for me. And I had to point out that we're the same height. That's amazing. Now, Beck, I'm going to say this, and this comes from a place of love and admiration. And I cannot think of a better way to phrase this other than you do occasionally dress a bit like a child. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't. That sounds worse than I mean it to sound. It's true, though. I think it's to um, do with the way that I dress, the fact that I wear a backpack a lot, which is going to make me hunch a bit. And um, I, I, I had this pointed out to me, but I walk with very heavy feet, which I you think you walk it, with very heavy feet. Yeah, I'm like quite, I'm a bit of a um, of a stomper when I walk. <laughs> wow, and and your husband is very tall. Yeah, he's quite tall. So I I wanted to tackle this problem because it's something that that my husband and I have experienced. However, um, the easy solution for us, arguably me, is that he does all of the cooking and washing up. Oh, that's an easy fix. And therefore, the height of the cupboards and counters does not affect me <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> so um, that's been one solution. I take it that that isn't a solution that Manic's brother and sister-in-law are happy with, especially as it sounds like the height of the things, it isn't good for both of them. Whereas in our case, the height of everything in our kitchen is, is suitable for Gav, but not necessarily me. So I thought, right, there's got to be more into this. And I contacted a friend um, who's a comedian and actor called Gareth Berlina, and he's married to an Australian actress called Corinna. Right. They... Uh, both have a YouTube channel. They've during lockdown. They've started doing their own kids show called Pirate and Parrot TV. If you go on YouTube, wow. it's so cute. It's very very fun, very interactive. So it's great if you've got young kids. 
Um, and Karina also has dwarfism. So there is quite a large height difference between the two of them. Yeah. And I asked how they deal with that in the kitchen. And Gareth explained to me about rise and fall counters. And those are counterweighted counters where you can have them rise or fall. You can have a sink, you can have a stove. And that means that you can bring them up to your height or bring them down to a lower height. I mean, first of all, you're right to laugh because every counter is technically counterweighted because it has mass. Yeah. Um, Secondly, is it like like an extreme version of a standing desk? Because a standing desk is just a flat surface. There's no plumbing or anything, but they can go up and down. And so I guess it's just that, but the sink and everything goes with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, amazing. And I was looking it up and some of them are a bit, they look a bit hacked together. Right. So I looked into it further because I wanted to find out what happens if, you, like, does that mean if you've got to put up with height differences and height differences can come about for any reasons as well. It might not be um, to do with your your actual height could be the fact that you're in a wheelchair and yeah. therefore you're in a sitting position most of the time. And so I was like, well, does that mean you would have to give up design in order for practicality? You know, it's it's a weird hmm. thing. So I looked into it more and I got in contact with Ed Warner, who has a company called Motion Spot, and they specifically make really sleek, beautifully designed interiors that take accessibility into mind. So I Jeez. posed oh. Manic's question to Ed and got this answer. Accessible kitchen design is almost a science in itself. We're often asked by customers how we can design a really beautiful, flexible and adaptable kitchen to suit the needs of different people. A couple of ways you can do this is designing uh, flexible worktops that can adjust uh, either at the press of a button electronically or uh, be operated on a manual winder. Effectively, the counter uh, goes up and down to suit the needs of whoever's using it. Particularly good uh, for someone who's short of stature uh, and maybe living with someone who isn't short of stature. Uh, But for many of our clients who may be in a wheelchair or just simply have arthritis in hips or or knees and need to perch while sitting uh, and performing a task in the kitchen, these flexible worktops are really good. Um, Key considerations are to have really clear space underneath the sink and the hob uh, so you can access underneath it in a wheelchair. Um, But another solution that we often design into accessible kitchens are drop-down baskets that are uh, located in overhead cabinets. And effectively, these bring the contents of the cabinet down towards you uh, as you're easily able to pull the basket down uh, and access the contents of the shelf. Uh, Again, particularly good uh, for anyone short of, of stature or struggling to reach above their shoulder. Hope that helps. Yeah, so that was Ed Warner, the founder of Motion Spot. And I should actually mention that they are launching a new brand called Fine and Able, which by the time we release this episode will be out. So if everyone checks them out, it, it, it'll be fineandable.co.uk. And of course, you can find the Motion Spot on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. So uh, yeah, check out Motion Spot if you want to look into that. So that feels like a very practical answer for Manix Brother. If they're struggling. We should make it very clear. We're not sponsored by these accessible kitchens or anything. They're just people making well-designed kitchens that are accessible. Correct. Yes, correct. Yeah, there has been no sponsorship. I'm just going to what whatever lengths I can to try and answer Manic's question. As well we should. Um, I should also thank um, uh, Gareth and Karina for their help as well. And they are also on TikTok, I should mention. Um, they've got some great stuff on TikTok. So that's at Gareth and Karina. That's spelt Gareth, A-N-D, and then K-I-R-U-N-A. Links in the podcast description. But there was another part to Manic's question, which was how Mm -hmm. do they stop their brother from complaining to them about this problem? Now, I think the clearest answer there is to get your brother to listen to this episode. (laughs) And not only will they find out what the answer is, but they'll also learn that if they complain to you, then it might end up as fodder for a podcast 
So they should be very careful with what they complain about. Yeah, any complaints to Manic are in no way in confidence, it turns out. They will be shared as entertainment fodder on a internationally listened to yet to be award-winning, but we're talking that kind of caliber podcast. And of course, if you know anyone else who has had a similar problem posed there, or indeed if you've had the similar problem and we've just solved it for you, then why not pay it forward by sharing this podcast with everyone you know so that we can help solve their problems as well. What do you reckon, Matt? Did I solve it? Well, I was. I agree that listening to this podcast does solve most problems. So yes, I, I, I think I can um, confidently give that a very firm ding. Yes, I got you to say ding. Ha ha! Finally. This next problem comes from Phil Chapman on Patreon, who says, My question is truly global. I'm wondering whether the recorded area of each country, as stated by encyclopedias, etc., assumes that the land is completely flat, completely smooth, i.e. part of the surface of a sphere, or takes into account topography. For some countries, e.g. the Netherlands, there might be little difference between these figures. But for others, e.g. Switzerland or Norway, the many steep mountains could surely make a significant difference. Any idea which country would exhibit the biggest difference and whether it would be enough to change its place in the traditional ranking of countries by land area? Thanks. I mean, that is a great problem. I was very excited when I saw this one come in. And I guess, in you know, in a nutshell, you've... Because if you've got a flat surface, any kind of terrain, any uh, up and down in altitude, any non-smooth, like any wrinkles in the surface, increase the amount of surface area. And I had never thought, I mean, it feels like such an obvious question now that Phil's thrown it at us. Who needs that problem? That's what I want to know. Like, why is that a problem for you specifically, Phil? I feel like that's the sort of problem you have if you have investments in land And you're trying to look for ways to capitalize further on that investment. (laughs) Trying to work out what value you're getting by surface. Like, should you buy mountainous terrain because it's better value in terms of surface area? Well, you know what? I can see why Phil has this as a problem because I hadn't thought of this before. But now that I've thought about it, and in hindsight, it seems like a really obvious question, I've become a, a little bit obsessed by it. So now I've got to solve it as well. Like, it's a problem for me. I need to know the answer to this. Oh, it's like that film The Ring. <laughs> to pass on the curse. Yeah, yeah. you gotta, you got to play it to someone else and then yeah. they're cursed. And you've got to... Uh, you got to get someone else obsessed by it within how many days, I forget. Um, so I, I really... I was like, wow, why have I never thought of that? And so I... First of all, I was like, well, you know what? I'll just look up the surface area of a country... And I'll find out who calculates that. And then I'll ask them how they did it. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. So I looked up the surface area of the UK, which is where we both live. And first of all, there's no one definitive number. There are two different numbers that get thrown around. There's 243,610 square kilometers and 242,495 square kilometers both very specific numbers is that because of the tides was one just calculated when the tides were out (laughs) no not the tides great point and a lot of people when i was chatting to them about this were like what about the tides you use the mean high water mark so there's like an agreed bit this is where the land ends i looked up because there's the uh, ordnance survey people the os maps there's an agreed boundary like the boundary exists. And so, yes, the, the tide comes in and out and the actual effective land value changes. But there's an agreed, this is kind of the edge of the, the land proper. For but now, yet there's not, until the ice caps the melt. One, exa- for now, yeah, that would have to be updated if we uh, have to. That, well, that would fix part of the problem. And <laughs> the, the numbers aren't different because one includes lakes and one doesn't. Um, because the the first number does include water, but yet if you subtract the water, you don't get the second number. And I spoke to some, like a few, like an academic said, maybe they were using different resolutions on the map to get those two different numbers. And there's actually a whole separate problem, which is 
it's actually, if you're just looking at the length of the boundary of a country, if you've got like a coastline, it's not even the area, famously, the length of a coastline changes based on how big a ruler you're using to measure it. And apparently, I couldn't fact check this, but apparently the coastline of Cornwall, if you use the 1 to 10,000 scale map from the OS maps, and then you compare it to the 1 to 50,000 scale map, there's a 100 kilometer difference length in just the coastline of Cornwall. And it's because a smaller ruler, if you're measuring smaller bits at a time, you can get in and out of more of the little ah. coves and bits that go in and out. Whereas the bigger ruler would just go straight across them and go, ah, it's straight, straight, straight. Yeah, as the crow flies. Yeah. And so, but then if you think, well, hang on, what if there was an even smaller ruler? It would get in and out of more little bits. I mean, all the way down to like grains of sand or atoms. And there's a famous thing in mathematics where a coastline is fractal, which means there's always more little coves and ins and outs that you could be measuring. And so there's no, like, there's no limit. There's no agreed this is how long a coastline is. Because you can always have a tinier ruler. You can always have, there's always a smaller ruler. <laughs> and so you've just got to agree, agree on a ruler length. And then that's what you use to measure it. Am I right in thinking that the problem with measuring a country is very similar to the problem we had of calculating the surface area of the t-shirt? Yes. But. Much harder. Yeah. So it's very bitty. It's difficult because of the shape. It's not difficult because of this fractal problem. Because even if you've got an infinitely long coastline or you've got this, you know, complex fractalness going on with length, you still have a definite area. You don't get the same runaway problem with area with this with this crazy border. But you right. do get the t-shirt problem, as we're now calling it, because mm -hmm. you get all these weird shapes. However, you can use a computer program to, to basically split it up like we did with the t-shirt into different bits and do all the areas separately, then add them all together. Mm -hmm. You can get software which will take the data for where the actual coastline border is and then um, give you an answer. But there were two things, two problems with this. Number one, I could not find out who is in charge of calculating the surface area of the UK. I couldn't, oh. both those numbers, I couldn't find any organization or academic outfit or university. No one owns those numbers. I mean, where do these pirates, come from? Surely pirates. Pi well, yes, pirates. Um, yeah, it, it, nothing. No one. No, no one would back up these numbers. And so in, in, a, in a bit of frustration, I then decided to start again with a different country. So I decided to, <laughs> to change to Australia, where we're both from. So I've yeah. gone from where we live to where we originate from. Australia, bit bigger, 7,656,127 square kilometers. Uh, that's roughly just over 31 uh, UKs. Is that including Tasmania? That is including Tasmania, correct. It's including all islands and I believe all surrounded lakes and water bodies. That's so just like okay. the, the land that's not the ocean, basically. And thankfully, I could find out who owns that number. It's oh. uh, Geoscience Australia. So th there's an actual official body in Australia who are like, yep, we'll take ownership for that number. Here it is. Wow. And so I went on to their website and I found that they took that from the uh, Geodata Coast 100K 2004 data set. And this is where I slammed into my second problem. I'd got past the first one. I know where this number comes from. But oh my goodness, geodata is the most confusing, bewildering data I've come across in my life. I was like, well, I'll just download that and have a look at it. Oh no, it is not in a nice format. As in, it's not format. <laughs> it's not format. Yeah, exactly. It was <laughs> desperate. It was not formatted, as they say in the business. Um, so I dropped them an email and I was like, hey, what's up with this data? And I sent them some questions. And I said, basically... Do you include the terrain or don't you? I think from looking at the data, there's no third dimension. There's no up and down. And they very kindly replied. And so I can confirm from Geoscience Australia, they do not include the terrain when they're calculating the surface area. So if this 
is standard practice, and I'm going to have to assume it is because they're the only organization I can get a national answer out of for a country. It's the footprint of the country, not the actual surface area. So when you see land area for a country, you're not getting all the ups and downs, all the bumps and creases. You're just getting the flat. This is like the, the footprint. This is, this is the area taken up by the country, not the actual surface area if you wanted to, you know. Not the shoe. Uh, wrap it or something. Yeah, not the shoe. You're getting, you're getting the footprint, not the shoe. But that was not the whole question from Phil. They then wanted to know if you did include the terrain, how much of a difference would it make? And so I put a call out on Twitter to try and find out who owned the stat of the UK surface area, inconclusive. I also asked people who could help me processing geodata because I was getting so lost and I just couldn't make head or tail out of it. And a few people came to my rescue. Uh, one of them, a person called Alastair Ray had previously thought about the same question and tried to answer it. Ooh. And they took a section of a, a section of mountains in Scotland. They took a 25 square kilometer chunk of land from the Cairngorm Mountains in Scotland. I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Someone will correct us afterwards. Mm -hmm. And they then analyzed how much the area changed if you included the up and down information. And they went and got the data from the OS maps. And you can publicly get certain levels of data, certain levels of resolution. They were able to access, I think, data you've got to pay for, but they were able to get it. I'll put a link to the free version below if anyone else wants to have a look at this um, data. But they came in to exactly the same problem that you get measuring a coastline because all the, all the ins and outs on the coastline, it can get longer and longer the more you go in and out. We've now got the same problem. It does become a problem with area if you've got 3D ups and downs. Because how small your surface area rule or whatever that is, lets you get into more hills. So oh, they yeah. found if, if, they, yeah, if they had data with a 50 meter resolution the surface area increased by 7.1%. But if they had a 5 meter resolution data set, it went up by 8%. So the, the more the resolution, the more area you get. So it's another fractal oh. problem. So technically, it depends. I mean, we know coastlines are, are fractal pretty much, but I don't know about the surface area of a country. I suspect it is as well, in which case... There's an infinite amount of surface area, which is probably not a helpful answer. Although uh, Alastair did then go on to look at some countries. They looked at Switzerland and found if you include the hills in Switzerland, it's got an extra 6.96% surface area compared to its footprint. And they did Liechtenstein. I don't know why they picked Liechtenstein. Well, because it's a small place, yep. but it's incredibly mountainous. Yeah, really. Oh, you know, I've been there once, and this was back in the days before SatNav, on a road trip with some friends, and we had printed out, like, the Google Map directions. So it was after Google Maps was invented, but before SatNav. And it had us turning right, and my memory, this is, like, way back, obviously, was we were on a bridge, and it was having us turn right onto the road, which was, like, a long way below us. And so obviously the, the map data did not include the third dimension. And we're like, we're, we're not going to turn right off the side of this bridge here. Um, but yeah, you're right. It must be like a super, super up and down country. Well, there you go. Well, it's got an extra 8.72%, more than Switzerland. It's more up wow. and downy than Switzerland by, by almost 2% up and downy. Hmm. So 8.72% more surface area compared to the footprint. So... I, at this point, I kind of felt like I'd answered the question, but I hadn't really got into which countries changed. And I wasn't happy because I hadn't analyzed the data myself or we hadn't, I hadn't seen like for the UK or somewhere like that. And I was like, there's some great visualizations here. And I, mm. I really did feel the, the same where I was like, you know what, now I'm really getting into this. I want to get some answers out of it. But there, there were two problems. It was taking a long time. 
And there's now a whole bunch of people who are helping me process a whole load of geodata, which is very exciting. And secondly, it got very visual. And you can have some very cool visualizations where you show how the terrain of a country or a state or a region is different to its footprint. Mm. So my plan here is I'm going to call this semi-dinged because I feel like i have pretty sure I'm convinced that the values you see don't include terrain when you see them stated online. Although uh-huh. I'm not, I've only got one example of Australia who have confirmed that for me. But I've not looked at how the rankings change. I looked at how some countries change. So that's something. I'm going to keep working on this. Okay. So we record this podcast a week or two normally before it goes out. So we've got time to, you know, for John to do the edit and everything else. I'm going to keep working on this. I'm going to try and put out a YouTube video on my Stand Up Mass channel when this podcast goes out on the last day of Ooh. the month. You reckon you'll have this all together in two weeks? I'm really nervous. I do not like setting myself deadlines. So, but I'm going to give it a go. So, when the podcast comes out, if you check my Stand Up Mass channel, and we'll put a link in the show notes for this podcast, I will have the rest of my findings and the visualizations and everything else. And I hope that will be the second half of the ding to comprehensively solve this problem. Um, so there you are. Uh, can I? Can I? Are you prepared to award a half ding? I'll give you a dit. Perfect. And you and get the mm later. I get the mm <laughs> when I come through with the goods online. So yes, uh, st- stay tuned. I mean, on you listening to it now in the future. Go and check it out. See if I succeeded. Our last problem today comes from Laura, who's another of our Patreons, who says, problem, colon. Why don't plastic things dry in the dishwasher? Why? Why? <laughs> Okay, it's pressing. Yeah, I don't know. Do you have this problem? Well, so yeah. So the first thing I have to ask, because I don't have a dishwasher. Oh. Um, insert, you know, joke about how my husband's the one that does everything in the kitchen now. I was about to say, we've established <laughs> that's not any of your concern. Yeah. I do. His <laughs> name's Gav. Lol, 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 lol. Um, so uh, we don't we don't have a um, an electric dishwasher machine. And so I'm assuming that this problem Ooh. suggests that other things do dry in the dishwasher, but plastic things yep. don't. Okay. I'm a... like in my head, nothing. It's like, cause we have a drip tray that you put everything into yep. once you've mm-hmm. washed it and then you let it air dry. So I assumed it was the same with a dishwasher in that you, you know, you, you have to just let it sit there and dry naturally, but. If some things are drying and some things aren't, that's a, it's a yeah. Tougher so point. your modern kind of energy efficient dishwasher uses the heat from the washing process to dry the dishes, I believe. Now I'm a huge dishwasher fan. Like ah, if I can automate <laughs> a tedious chore, I'm there. So I love the fact that I can um. Just put dishes in the dishwasher, close it, magical cupboard, they come out clean. Ah, incredible. And it's true, when you get your dishes out, most of it will be dry to the touch, but plastics won't. And so this problem actually only came in very recently. And and so, but I got so excited, I was like, we have to talk about this in this episode of Problem Squared. And so I put a whole bunch of different things in my dishwasher this morning, <laughs> put them through, like, and sorry, then Sorry, when you say checked... different things, like I'm assuming dishes, not like... Oh, all kitchen things. No, yeah, a, it wasn't just cat. like a, a brick, a book. No, yeah. <laughs> um, it was things you'd normally put in a dishwasher. And I need to disclose my dishwasher, and this was life-changing, when it finishes washing, it opens itself. What? That sounds like a recipe for danger. No, 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 no. I would trip over that all the time. Now, okay, by open itself, it cracks open maybe five centimeters, maybe between three and five centimeters, if I had to say. Like it just, it just slightly ajar. Oh, so it releases all of its steam. Yeah, it doesn't like wham open like that would be the bulk <laughs> of my kitchen if it did that. No, no, no. It, it just, it just pops ajar, and so that way. Because 
the issue is, yes, dishwashers are pretty good at drying, but if they're closed, obviously it's a bit of a challenge because you want your dishwasher to be nice and watertight. You don't want water going everywhere. But yet, how are the things supposed to drive? Hey, Matt. Hmm? Why is it easiest to put jam on toast in your house? Why is it easiest to put jam on toast in my house? I don't know. <laughs> because your dishwasher pops a jar. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Uh, bye. bye. I can't believe I didn't get See that. See you next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Back out. <laughs> now, for the record, most dishwashers don't do this, but when I realized some did, it was a deal breaker when we moved in and we needed to get a dishwasher. I was like, I want one that opens itself. It's amazing. You put you put the dishes in, you can you can leave. You can even go on like <laughs> vacation or a trip. You can and you know you're not gonna come back to like you know, horrible, sweaty dishes that have been trapped in a moist dishwasher for weeks. It's going to pop itself open. It will dry. Amazing. So what I did was I waited for it to finish. It finishes and it pops open slightly. And then I was there. Boom. I opened it. I put everything out to see what would still be wet and what will have correctly dried. And my theory was it comes down to the specific heat capacity of the materials. So some things hold heat better than other things. And there's this weird, there's a difference between heat and temperature. And things can be at the same temperature, but they can have different amounts of heat energy in them because some things heat up easier than others. No, no, don't like this. No, exactly. I know, I know. This hurts my brain. It's the most ridiculous bit of physics. So, yeah, water takes a lot of energy to heat up. Uh, wood takes a lot of energy to heat up. But some things don't take much energy at all to heat up. I think my feet then is are made of wood because my feet are cold all the time. And it takes ages to warm my feet up. I have to put my feet in a bath when they're cold because otherwise they stay cold. I have found a list here, an engineering lookup list of the specific heat capacity of different substances. I can't see feet on here mm. but i will believe that your feet have a large exactly exactly that point right some things warm up easier than others if you name a substance i'll see if i can look up its specific heat capacity chocolate <laughs> chocolate okay here we go not on the list ah see this is the problem the closest thing i can do for you charcoal <laughs> takes 840 joules of energy per one degree celsius change per kilogram of charcoal and chromium that's in the similar part of the list that takes less energy that's only 452 joules per degree celsius per kilogram okay so we're getting to a point where i'm stopping caring so let's bring it back God, okay right okay right 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 so you're right okay um th <laughs> thank you Th that's why we're such good friends. You don't have any issue in telling me that in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> I've probably got it wrong. I suspect there's a lot of listeners who are like, what? No, tell me about Chromium more. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're right. This is, and this is not just a podcast thing. This is just our normal lives. Beck was like, I'm getting <laughs> bored now, Matt. I'm like, oh, thanks. Good, good. Good to know. So here's the thing. It means when the dishwasher opens, while everything may be at the same temperature, because temperatures equalize until they're in equilibrium, not everything will have the same amount of heat energy stored in it. And so some things have more, they're holding on to more heat that they can use to uh, evaporate off the water than other things. And so my theory is plastic is just not got a high enough specific heat capacity to store enough energy to be able to then dry itself whereas ceramics are going to hold more energy and so they will dry which is why when you take them out a dish might be really hot still yeah but a but a plastic tupperware container might be quite cold exactly yeah and there's some other issues with how things conduct to to give you the energy but you're absolutely right you'll pick up a dish and go oh that's still hot because it's still got lots of energy and it can transfer mm. that to you but plastic so. so I tried putting in a very thick plastic like chopping board and a very thin plastic like uh, Tupperware storage container to see if the thicker plastic would have enough heat stored in it to be able to dry. And my initial results were that it worked. So the chopping board was dry, 
but the Tupperware container was wet. Now, while I was taking photos of everything in the dishwasher to document the amount of surface water, uh, Lucy had some follow-on questions. And when I explained the idea, she's like, well, is, doesn't it come down to the... Um, is it to do with the uh, actual surface of it? Like dishes are smooth? Yeah, yeah. And plastic has little dents in it. And so it's going to hold on to the liquid more than the smooth stuff. Exactly. And Lucy mentioned surfactants. That's my theory. Well, she was like, hey, check out the rinse aid. And so I found the rinse aid that we put in the dishwasher. And it lists that it contains non-ionic or something, non kind of non-charged surfactants. And they're used to cause the water to spread out and not bead. Ah. So I think you're right. I think how the water interacts with the materials in terms of maybe does it drain off versus does it bead and stay put? I'm going to add a third one in as well. Oh, no. Yep. I've got yep. a third thing, which is most plastic things are containers. I'm going to imagine like tumblers and yep. and uh, various brands of stuff. Yep. Can't argue with that. Yeah. Which means that most of it is concave. Yep. Which means that if it's upside down, which is generally the way I imagine you put them into a dishwasher. Yes, indeed. Then the... Steam will rise and then more likely sit on the Ooh. surface of it on the inside, whereas plates and things, it'll it'll have less to grip onto and and just just dissipate above it. Roll off. That's interesting. Yeah. Or steam off the top and then have no ceiling to hit. That's interesting because oh, because I did put it in a bunch of bowls, but they were kind of in the rack. They're on a bit of an angle. Huh. Interesting. If you put a ceramic bowl upside down, will the inside still be wet when your dishes are dry? The problem is the uh, ceramic bowl, they're, they're, you're right, they're concave, but they're very, they're curved. And so I think the water can run down. Whereas I think all the Tupperware is like a flat surface. And so the oh, water but I mean underneath, Matt. Underneath the, the bowl, not on top. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you, you, you put things in upside down. Yeah. Facing down. But a bowl is a continuous arc. So any water will run down the sides. But if you've got a flat surface, there's no there's no slope for it to run down. So it'll just, the beads of water will sit on it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The other thing is I've got a pot, which is metal, and it's always still wet on the inside. Mm. And maybe it's because it's a flat surface. Oh, that's now I'm... This yeah, started out know. as a throwaway, quick, funny problem to end this episode with and has quite possibly become the hardest problem that we've ever had to deal with. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. You've had more luck explaining the differences in land surface area <laughs> than you then, have uh... explaining the wetness of plastic. <laughs> oh, I have to do more experiments. I feel like this might be one that our listeners can help with as well. Yeah, I think we're going to need some suggestions. So what was the wording from Laura's question? What do we want people to look into for us? So the wording was, why don't plastic things dry in the dishwasher? And more specifically then in capitals, why? Why? Okay, I thought my specific heat had it, but then Lucy mentioned surfactants, and now you've come through with the actual surface and shape. the shape and the orientation. Oh, my goodness. Okay, everyone, if you can try some things in your dishwasher, don't do anything special. Just whenever you've finished washing your dishes in a dishwasher, see what's dry, what's not, will crack what they have in common. Oh, and if anyone is actually just... a you know, an expert on this, just, you know, tell the, tell us as oh, well. Oh, you actually know, yes. Yeah, yes, that, 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 that would, that would that, be that's even also, better. That's also fine. <laughs> I can't keep making limited edition watercolours for people who do <laughs> stuff in their kitchen. Give it a go. <laughs> I don't have the time. <laughs> it's time for some updates. So last time we talked about big things and we tried to work out what the biggest big thing was by scale. And we put out a plea for someone to visit the big macadamia nut in Queensland. And someone has gotten very close, but not quite. <laughs> so, so Colin, Colin uh, Jemine, sorry if I mispronounced your surname there, Colin, or your first name for all I know, they've sent in a highlights reel of a previous trip they did around Queensland. They went and they saw the big banana, that is a big banana. They went and saw the big lawn bowl. Ooh. And what I love about Colin, 
Colin poses to match the thing. Love it. So for the big lawn bowl, Colin's arranged himself like he's bowling the big lawn bowl. Great. Uh, kind of cowering. Oh, he's, he's under the big axe. Yep. Brilliant. Nowhere to be seen near the big headphones. But disappointing there. Just standing under the big shrimp and and definitely the big banana. I mean, what more can you do when you're a big banana? Is it, I, I think I mean, he's, I really... uh, he just looks excited. He's not doing anything I more creative does. than that. Yes. Oh, okay. Very, <laughs> not that excited. Um, so, yeah. So, <laughs> Colin is currently sent in the most photos of themselves with big things. Great stuff. We've also had some good ones come in on Twitter. So, I'll be retweeting some of those. Uh, we may also have someone visiting the Big Macadamia up between now oh, and when this is released. So um, do keep an eye out on our Twitter and Instagram for any updates on that. It's at a problem squared. We also need another recap on your £5,000 t-shirt. Yeah. So uh, two things to say. First of all, we're on the other side of it. We're on the back of the t-shirt now. Over halfway. Over halfway, which means that we've raised over two and a half grand for water aid. Amazing. And uh, well on the way to hitting our target. In fact, the only thing holding us back is how long it takes for me to do. I really underestimated the amount of effort involved for doing 500 tiny pieces of art. Yeah. Um, the other update I have is um, some people have been very generous and lovely and uh, as well as buying squares, um, popping me a little bit of... Uh, drink money on my coffee account and that means I was able to go and buy a proper set of fabric markers that have Ooh. two thicknesses so a big one but a thinner one as well which means I can do slightly more detailed things and a lot more colors still not all the colors but a lot more colors so people buying squares now will get a higher quality or at least better resolution. Yeah. Oh. A better resolution and um and uh, prettier stuff. Still bear in mind that it is three and a half centimeters by three and a half centimeters on fabric per square. So it's still not as detailed as I'd like, but I will say that the quality of pictures on the back of the shirt will probably, arguably, be better than the ones on the front. Hmm. So if someone had bought a bunch of squares on the front to get you to draw a scale recreation of the rest of the t-shirt on the t-shirt. Yes. Then now, like, like exactly like I did, then I'm now, I've got the low resolution version of that on the front. Has anyone bought squares on the back to make a, a, a scale copy of the back of the t-shirt on the back of the t-shirt? Not to my knowledge. Huh. I say that knowing that there will be a slight delay between this being recorded and going out. But uh, okay. people can check. People can check with us at a problem squared on Twitter or uh, indeed. No, no, um, no, no. Don't check. All right, people. You know what to do. What? Oh my gosh! If everyone takes up, if ev if the whole back of it is scale versions of the back of it, then all of the t-shirts on the back will have to have multiple pictures of the t-shirts yep oh that hurts my brain i'm prepared to, to step up and do this again but other people come on uh, we need uh, one or more people buying smaller versions of the t-shirt space to go on the back of the t-shirt oh that's gonna be so good you did an eight eight squares didn't you four i did eight then... that that's the bar and i'll do it again but i'm sure someone <laughs> can do better than me if people want to go buy squares um, with the money going to Water Aid, that is Beck Hill Comedian. That's Beach Hill Comedian. Dot com forward slash shop. We'll chuck a link in the show notes. Before we finish up, I realized something listening back to the last episode because, yep. yes, I do listen to our podcast. It's a good podcast. Great podcast. Yeah. And I realized that the last episode was numbered 007. Yep. And at no point did we mention James Bond. Oh. And we'd talked about this in a previous episode because I made fun of you for not using O as shorthand for zero. For correctly not using O. 007. And someone on Twitter, I think, replied after that episode aired and said that it is actually two O's, oh. not two zeros. So apparently in the books, they do use the letter O 
but it is referring to the number zero. Whoa, whoa, what? Hang on. So when you read it, it is an 007, but the but what, it so means it's, it's typeset as an O. Yeah. But it's meant to be a zero. I reckon it's. I reckon they did That's it. That's outrageous. This is my theory. Fleming did it because they specifically wanted us to pronounce it double O seven, but knew that if they use zeros, people like you would complain. <laughs> They don't get to just decide what symbol we use. <laughs> zeros. Oh, my. It's a license to kill. It's not a license to mess with numbering systems. That's a, I'm, I'm genuinely <laughs> quite upset. Like, that's the, probably not the only thing in those books that's aged badly, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, to be fair. Maybe that's what you should do, Matt. Maybe you should go on and uh, rewrite all the books to be... Um, not just politically correct, but also numerically correct. Numerically correct. Yeah. Finally, we just wanted to mention that we are living through phenomenal times and we've both been amazed at all the positive things coming out of the Black Lives Matter campaign, everything that's going on. And we realize that if you're listening to this podcast, by default, you do enjoy listening to podcasts. Yeah, and if anything, you're if you're like me and wanting to educate yourself more, I can thoroughly recommend Into America, hosted by Tremaine Lee. Uh, also, in fact, recent episodes on other human interest podcasts such as uh, This American Life. There's a great one on Science Versus about protesting in a pandemic. Um, the most recent Reply All episode is really fascinating as well. There's just been some really good stuff out there, so thoroughly recommend that as well as checking out the website podcastsincolor.com. That's colour spelt the American way, C-O-L-O-R, podcastsincolor.com. And there you can check out any type of podcast on any category that you like, depending on what you're in the mood for. Just broaden your range and make your subscription just a little bit more interesting by hearing some from some more diverse voices. 